As you can see on the screen, I'm going to be speaking about Israel's willful rejection of Jesus Christ contradicts Calvinism. I think this is a nice tie-in to what Dr. Tony Badger was talking about. And you can look at this from various angles to see that Calvinism requires using a very big shoehorn to make everything in the Bible fit in the shoe <laughs> because it just doesn't all fit. And Calvinism uh, has something called replacement theology. And replacement theology is the idea that God made eternal promises to Israel which will not be fulfilled to Israel because Israel failed and therefore God has taken the eternal promises to Israel and he's given them to the church. And so the church replaces Israel in God's program. And according to this program, according to this way of looking at it, Israel will not be some special nation in the kingdom. Jews will not be special people in the kingdom. Jews are no longer God's chosen people, etc. However, that's totally contrary to the scriptures. And in fact, when Jesus spoke of the elect in the Gospels, who was he talking about? He was obviously talking about the Jewish people. The Jewish people were, are the chosen people. That's why we have chosen people ministry. And whenever Jesus would speak of the elect, he wasn't talking about the church. He was talking about Israel, his chosen people. Now, Calvinism's view of total depravity, let's see, am I hitting it wrong? There we go. Calvinism's view of total depravity is that the unregenerate uh, are like cadavers at the bottom of a well. The story they use is they say, imagine you had a dead body at the bottom of a well, and you called down to the dead body and said, we're going to save you. All you've got to do is grab the rope. Here, I'm throwing the rope down to you. Well, how able is that dead body to grab the rope? Not at all, because cadavers don't do anything. And so in their view, the unregenerate person has total inability. And the result of this way of looking at it is that a person actually has to be born again before they can believe. Now, a lot of people don't realize that's what Calvinism says. They think Calvinism is saying that logically regeneration precedes faith, but that in time they occur together. Well, there are some Calvinists that say that, but there are many Calvinists that says it's not just logical, it has to be in time, because how could a dead person using their cadaver view grab the rope or believe or do anything? And so in their, uh, there's one book by a man named Smallman who uh, illustrates the new birth from a Calvinist perspective like human pregnancy. And he says that just as in human pregnancy, a child, once it's conceived, is a human being, but it's not until nine months later that the child is born. Well, in the same way, they would say a person is born again, but this faith that God later gives doesn't necessarily occur very quickly. In fact, he gives one illustration in the book of somebody who came to faith more than six decades after being born again. <laughs> so the person's born again, and then, and of course, how they know they were born again at this point, um, and then later that, I don't know. But if there are any verses in the Bible, and there are plenty, which indicate that there are such things as unregenerate people who actually reject Christ, who actually reject the offer of everlasting life, then Calvinism collapses. Because they can't reject it, they can't accept it, they can't do anything. There's no will on the part of the unregenerate person. And the examples I'm going to give in this message concern God's chosen people, Israel, but we could look outside of this
as well. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. And we'll be looking at verses 37 to 39. And uh, Jesus is preparing to go to the cross, and he says in verses 37 to 39, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together. That is, the residents of Jerusalem, the residents of Judea, the residents of all of Israel. He's speaking to Jerusalem as a capital city of Judea and the nation. I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Notice these words, but you were not willing. According to Calvinism, willingness has nothing to do with anything. Because the unregenerate people have no ability to resist or reject anything. It's irresistible grace. And so in their view, what Jesus is saying here is impossible. But you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus offered the kingdom to that generation of Jews. If they had accepted him and they had believed in him, then what would have happened is the time of Jacob's trouble would have come immediately and the kingdom evidently would have begun around 40 A.D., A.D. 40. But instead, they rejected the offer of the kingdom through the Lord Jesus Christ. Then they continued to reject the re-offer of the kingdom through the apostles. And so 70 A.D. or A.D. 70 occurred and there was the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, killing of over a million Jews, and, and uh, being spread around the world. Note those telling words, but you were not willing. Calvinism basically says that whatever God wants to do, God does. Well, here, God wanted to gather Israel, wanted to gather Jerusalem, but because of the unwillingness of the people, God did not force himself upon that generation of Jews. That's inconsistent with Calvinism. Now, we can see a lot of other examples. For example, in uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 11 to 15, look back there, Matthew 11, 11 through 15. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. But all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. Notice the words. If you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. I think what the Lord is saying here is this. If Israel had received the, mess the message of the forerunner, John the Baptist, the one who was the forerunner of Messiah, then what would have happened is he would have been the fulfillment of the prophecies in Malachi that one like Elijah was going to come and the kingdom would follow on the heels of that. However, because Israel rejected the ministry of John the Baptist... He wasn't Elijah who is to come. And therefore, and this is an interesting view, you remember there are going to be how many witnesses in the book of Revelation? How many key witnesses? Two. And they're coming in the spirit and power uh, of, uh, for sure, Elijah, and then secondly, Moses. Remember Moses said in Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 to 18, that a prophet like me will, will arise? Zane Hodges, in his new commentary on John, he, he had made it through John 6.21 before he went to be with the Lord, suggests that the prophet could have been Jesus had the nation have received him, but because the nation was not willing, the prophet will be one of the two witnesses. So one of the two witnesses will fulfill Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 to 18, 
The other is going to fulfill the prophecies in Malachi about the forerunner. Yes. Hold it up higher. Sorry. Okay, the prophecy about the forerunner. And so the point here is it's willingness. If willingness has nothing to do with anything, then why do we say if you're willing to receive it? Look also at Matthew 21, verses 24 through 27. Matthew 21, 24 through 27. Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which I, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I'll do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? Well, they felt trapped. Let's see, is that advancing there? No. Yeah, they felt uh, trapped, and so, um, let's see, we're going too far here. Uh, and so, they reasoned, if we say, well, it's from heaven, then he's going to say, why didn't you believe him? Now, how could Jesus say, then, why didn't you believe him, if believing John the Baptist was impossible? Wouldn't that be silly? But he says, okay, they say, well... Why didn't you believe him? But if we say for men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So the answer Jesus said, we don't know. And he says, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. There's culpability on their part because they're not willing to give an honest answer to what he's asking. And if they were willing, Jesus would have given them more revelation. He's already told them, of course, that he's doing it by the authority of the Father, that he's sent by the Father to give these words. But he doesn't have to keep saying it over and over and over again if they're not going to receive the testimony which God has sent in terms of John the Baptist and, of course, Jesus himself. Uh and notice also in, uh, let me see if I can turn the page here. And in that passage, uh, the Lord goes on to say, John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but tax collectors and harlots believed him. Notice he doesn't say God gave tax collectors and harlots the gift of faith. He doesn't say God regenerated tax collectors and harlots and then they believed. And he doesn't indicate that they were incapable of believing. Everything what he's, that he's saying here suggests they're culpable for not believing because they were capable of believing. You did not afterwards relent and believe him, Matthew 21, 32. But clearly they could have believed, but they did not. And if you look at that section in Matthew 21, 25 to 32... It's all about the fact that they could have believed and that there were people in Israel that believed. And the really indicting point is that the people who believed were for the most part not the religious leaders. There were some of the re religious leaders like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea that came to faith. But for the most part, they were the great opponents of Jesus. They were the ones that we're getting the crowds to yell out, crucify him, crucify him. And the ones who were accepting him, for the most part, were the outcasts of the society. But they were all culpable and they were all capable. And so the issue here was not that somehow God only allowed some and not others. Also, look at John 5, 39 and 40. I love this verse, or these verses. A friend pointed these out to me about a year ago or so, and I'd seen it many times, but it hadn't clicked in until this person pointed it out. And then other things started coming out. Notice, John 5, 39, you search the Scriptures. What, what is that? What Scriptures? The Old Testament, because there was no New Testament at this point. So this is what we call Genesis to the Italian prophet, Malachi. Yeah, or in the Hebrew Bible, there are various ones, various can ways they were organized, but many of them were tell chronicles. 
from Genesis to Chronicles, but in any case, it was the Old Testament. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have what? Eternal life. How many people have you read that said there was no concept of everlasting life in the Old Testament? Well, if that's the case, then why didn't they say to Jesus, what are you talking about? And why did the rich young ruler come to Jesus and say, what do I need to do to have eternal life? If there's no concept of everlasting life in the Old Testament, and Jesus is speaking to Old Testament people during the Old Testament economy before the birth of the church, then either Jesus is lying here, or they really were searching the Scriptures to find out about how they might have eternal life. He says, you search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. In other words, they were ultimately thinking the Old Testament Scriptures tell us how to live, and if we live righteously, and if we are good Jews, then we're going to make it into the kingdom. And he's saying that's wrong. Notice what he says. And these are they which testify of me. That is, the Old Testament Scriptures testify of Jesus. Remember John chapter 1? Look back there at John chapter 1. You have, for example, in verse 44, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. They're saying, we know the Old Testament wrote about him. This is Messiah. This is the one who fulfills all the Old Testament commands. I mean, all, all types of prophecies about him. And so Jesus says, the Old Testament prophesies about it. But notice what he says in verse 40. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Why would he say, but you are not willing to come to me unless willingness is part and parcel of believing. If a person is responsive to the revelation they have, then God will give them more light, more revelation. If they reject the light they have, then God in many cases is not going to continue to give them more light. Now in some cases, in God's grace, He will continue to give more. But the point is, a person must be willing in order to believe. There must be a willingness to respond to the truth. Otherwise, what does he mean in verse 40? But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. There's nothing here about God making you willing. There's nothing here about the problem is on God's side, not your side. The issue in all these passages we're looking at is the issue is the problem is on the legalistic side of the Jewish listeners. And so they were not uh, responding to the light they had. Uh, also, we'll have to s summarize these. Um, he indicates they could come. The problem isn't that they're cadavers. The problem isn't they can't understand what he's saying. The problem is they reject what he and the Old Testament scriptures have to say. Um, in John 10, 25, and 37, and 38, Jesus uh, says uh, in John 10, 25, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Stop and think about it. If you had been around while Jesus is raising the dead, healing the sick, Jesus is prophesying about the future. Jesus is speaking in a way that no one has ever spoken before. He answers any of the rabbis, any of the Pharisees, any of the Sadducees. There's no question too difficult for him. And you saw the works that he did. Don't you think that that should incline you to believe what he's saying? <laughs> I mean, if we had been physically present, it would seem like it would be easier to believe when you hear Jesus say these things as compared to reading them in the Scriptures. Now, to be honest with you, the, even reading them in the Scriptures, it should be extremely persuasive if we're simply open, if we're simply responsive. And the issue is not that God is only allowing a small percentage of humanity to be born again, or that Jesus only died for a small percentage of
of humanity. And so Israel rejected the ministry of Jesus. Um, and later Jesus said, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. In other words, if you don't believe me, look at the works and the works will convince you to believe me. <laughs> you, will, you will end up believing me, but you will come through seeing the works that I've done. And Israel willfully rejected the testimony of God the Father. This would be Matthew 22, verse 3, and John 7, 16, and 17. You remember when he talks about the fact the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. He sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Why, again, this reference to an unwillingness to come? And probably this is a reference to uh, Israel and Israel's rejection. And then, let's see. Um, you've got the marriage supper here, and you've got this discussion. And then in John seven sixteen and 17, Jesus answered and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. In other words, Jesus isn't making this stuff up. Jesus received it from God the Father, who sent him to proclaim this doctrine. If anyone wills to do his will, that is, if anyone is willing to do what God wants him to do, that is, believe in Jesus, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. Jesus' point here is, if someone is willing to do the will of the Father, and the will of the Father is to believe in the Son whom he sent, well, then he'll know if he's simply willing. One of the things I, I tell people a lot is, look, if you're not sure that you have everlasting life, and you don't know where you're going when you die, why not do this? Why not pray and ask God to say, look, if it's really as simple as simply believing in Jesus and believing his promise of everlasting life, would you show me? I'm going to read a chapter of John's Gospel every day, and I ask you to just show me if it's that simple. And then read John chapter 1 one day, and then John chapter 2, and every day just pray, God, if it's possible to be sure, show me. I don't think there'd be anybody that lacked assurance if they prayed that, and they were sincere that they wanted God, they were willing to do God's will, and then they came to God's Word and His book that's telling us the promise of life, well, then they would gain that assurance. But the problem is, many, many people today are like Naaman before his servants got him in his right mind. You remember what happened? Naaman, the Syrian commander, and he comes to Israel because he's got leprosy and he's heard there's a prophet there that can heal him. And he comes to the prophet and he says, well, go to the Jordan and dip seven times and you'll be healed. And he's like, that's ridiculous. I'm not doing that. How stupid is that? He should have had some incantation or something or told me to do something really hard. And so then his servants say, look, why don't you do what he says? And he ultimately does and he's healed. And that's the same way with the promise of everlasting life. If we're willing to do it, then just cry out to God and say, is it really that simple? Show me. And God will. But Calvinism eliminates all that But because for Calvinism, there's no seeking God. There's no responding to God. There's none of that. If anyone wills to do his will. Have you noticed a repeated refrain in all these various passages? It's, but you were not willing, or if anyone is willing. Israel willfully rejected the testimony of prophecies about Christ, and that's a verse we've already looked at before, John 5, 39 and 40. You search the Scriptures for in them, because in them you think you have everlasting life, but these are they which testify of me. If they were reading the Old Testament properly, they would know this. Well, weren't there many people in the Old Testament that knew they had everlasting life? Sure there were. In fact, when Jesus comes on the scene, the baby Jesus, at 40 days he's brought to the temple, there are two saints there, Anna and Simeon, both of whom know they have eternal life, both of whom know this is the Messiah. And Simeon says, this is the Lord's salvation. 
This is the one who is delivering Israel. This is Messiah. He knew that. He had no doubts. He had eternal life. And, of course, his disciples came to faith, all but Judas. They came to faith as they saw it, saw the evidence, and they came to faith. So it wasn't like this was some impossibility. Uh, they willfully rejected prophecies about Christ. And there are a lot of prophecies about Christ in the Old Testament. And Israel willfully rejected more than two or three witnesses. You know, in the Old Testament, if you had two or three witnesses, a matter is confirmed, right? Well, you have the testimony of God the Father, even verbally. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, right? And you have the Father sending the Son. You have the works that the Son did. You have the Old Testament prophecies. You have the ministry of John the Baptist. You have all of this. Uh, and all of the Old Testament prophets as well, and yet they rejected it. Oh, and it says, this is Acts 13.46. Take a look here. You know, Acts 13.46 says, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. I don't think that's a good translation. I think it's something like as many as positioned themselves uh, in light of eternal life believed, or prepared themselves for eternal life believed. But look at verse 36, which mentions everlasting life two verses before. He said, Then Barnabas and Paul grew bold and says, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, to the Jews first, but also to the Greeks. But since you reject it, notice, you reject it. It wasn't just something they didn't understand or believe. They actually rejected it, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Notice it doesn't say God judged you unworthy of everlasting life. Who's the one that judged them unworthy of everlasting life? They themselves did. We have this on the words of the apostles. That the, these Jews who heard the promise of everlasting life considered themselves unworthy of it. Why? Because they rejected the message of life. And by doing that, they were considering themselves unworthy of it. And so he says, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. None of this fits Calvinism. Israel willfully rejected the testimony of the apostles about Christ. They were rejecting the word of God about Messiah. And God wasn't the one who was rejecting them. All of this is contrary to Calvinism. The issue in each case was not divine election, but human unwillingness. Israel, in the time of Christ, proves by its willful rejection of Christ that Calvinism is not true. Now, are there people alive today, Jews and Gentiles, that willfully reject Christ? Sure. And are there people who freely receive and believe in Jesus Christ today? Yes. No one is forced not to believe and no one is forced to believe. I'm going to speak later on about verses like Tony mentioned, Romans 3.11. No one seeks God. No, not one. Right? And Calvinists really like that verse. But they have real trouble with, for example, Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. And so I believe Ken Yates is speaking about Cornelius, but here's a man who's clearly seeking God. And in, and in fact, the angel says, your alms and your prayers have ascended to God as a pleasing aroma. And so Cornelius is clearly one who's seeking God. How do we explain that in light of Romans 3.11? As Tony says, Romans 3.11 is really looking at it from the standpoint of if God did not take the initiative, we would never seek him. But because God has already taken the initiative and continues to take the initiative, everybody can respond by seeking him. Because, remember Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all unto me. And we have the idea that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. God is drawing all toward faith in Christ. And if people do not respond to that, that's not God's problem. Uh, Calvinism is not true because unbelief is a willful rejection of the truth. Now look, I've written and I believe that belief is not a choice. However, you can make the choice not to listen to the evidence. 
Therefore, unbelief can be a choice. In other words, if you say, I'm not willing to listen to any Christians to hear about this Christian message, well then, you have cut yourself off from the message of eternal life. But once you hear that message, either the evidence persuades you or it doesn't. If it doesn't persuade you, you might have some inclination to say, but you know, there sounds like there could be some truth in that. And so you might begin to pray about it. You may begin to go to a church. You may begin to talk to some people. I remember when I came to faith, it was a course of four or five weeks of meeting with the Campus Crusade for Christ staff member, and he just kept hammering Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And like a good yes, but counselee, I'd say, yes, but what about James 2? 14 through 26. What about Hebrews 6, 4 to 8? And he would go to these other, but then he'd go right back and quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And he said, you know, whatever these other verses say, they can't contradict Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You think it's of works, but it's not of works. It's not of works. It's not of works. How many times do you need to hear it? It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. And I finally got it. And that's true of all of us. At some point, we got the promise, the simple promise uh, unbelievers are not like cadavers or rocks. Unbelievers can understand and believe biblical truth. The funny thing is, Calvinists agree that an unbeliever can be a theist. Well, how can they be a theist if they're a cadaver? Cadavers can't believe anything. Unbelievers can believe lots of true doctrines. They can believe Jesus died on the cross. They can believe Jesus rose from the dead. They can believe the Bible is the word of God. Calvinists would say all that an unregenerate person can believe. Well, how is that possible if they're a cadaver? How can they believe any spiritual truth if they have no spiritual sensitivity whatsoever? Answer, they can't. Either you have to say they're unable to believe anything the Bible says, or they're able to believe everything the Bible says. You really can't have it both ways. Let's see. Okay, that's the end. Okay, so it's not going to advance any. It's not going to advance anymore. Okay, all right. So in conclusion, the point I'm trying to make here is this: Israel would have gathered. It would have been gathered by Jesus. Jesus would have gathered Israel. He would have brought the kingdom, but they weren't willing. And we see that repeated over and over and over again. We see that they searched the Old Testament scriptures for in them they thought they had eternal life. But the, they were those which testified of Jesus, but you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. Calvinism, I believe, is very well-intentioned, but the problem with Calvinism, it's a philosophical system. It's not something which naturally flows out of the Scriptures. And if we want to be biblical Christians, let's point people to the promise of eternal life found in John 3.16 or John 5.24 or Ephesians 2.8.9 or many other texts and let's not assume that they're cadavers, because you're not going to find that anywhere in the Bible. That's a, a made-up thing. We've got a few minutes for some questions or comments. So if you have any questions or comments, try to keep them short so we can hopefully get uh, quite a few. Uh, question about this idea of Israel's rejection of Christ contradicts Calvinism. Yeah, Larry. Okay, I believe we're going to have more talks on this, but Acts, take a look at Acts 13.48. And I have a couple of articles on our website if you go to faithalone.org. The key word in Acts 13.48 is the word appointed. It says, as many as have been appointed to eternal life believed. Now, do all your translations say appointed? Yeah? I'm not sure if there's any other tra um, favorite translation. This is the Greek verb tasso. And it's used in military arrangements from arranging troops, etc., positioning troops, that sort of thing. Uh, and I think the correct understanding here is these are people who 
prepared themselves for everlasting life by being open to the teaching that they heard from the apostles. But I would suggest you go on the website and take a look at this. I think the key thing in understanding 48 is going back to 46. Whatever 48 says can't contradict 46. And the Calvinist understanding of Acts 13.48 contradicts verse 4. The other problem is Acts 13.48 does not actually speak of choosing or election, does it? Appointed is not one of the normal words for election or choosing. And it, I don't even think it means appointed here. I think it means something like it's a middle passive, and so I think the idea is someone who positioned themselves or prepared themselves, something like that. Yeah, John? He's got a mic. Two things about the verb. It uh, does not, uh, as a middle passive, it does not say who did it. And the second thing is it does not say when it was done. And so verse 46 can easily be the answer for who did it and when it was done. Listen to him. That's a good point. Yes, Jeff. That's great. Why would I want to argue against that? Um, it doesn't fit their system, however. If, if cadavers are given a measure of faith, how does that work? I mean, how can you talk with a cadaver at the bottom of the well? I mean, it's a cadaver. Well, that's the illustration that many Calvinists use. They say dead and trespasses and sins means you have no spiritual sensitivity. But, okay, if they're going to say God has given each one... Uh, a measure of faith, and they're they're going to claim that's re in relationship to the unregenerate. Then fine. So God's giving the unregenerate faith. So He gives the gift of faith to the unregenerate, but not in not the gift of faith for eternal life, but other things. Is that what we're being led to believe? I don't get that. It doesn't make sense to me. I mean, maybe the Calvinists have some way of handling that, but it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Do you have any other questions from the online people? Uh, not, yet. not yet, okay. Yes, up here. Brian. So what did the Calvinists say Israel, Israel will be rejected? Wouldn't the Calvinists say that Israel will be rejected because God sovereignly agreed that they would be Yeah, I suppose. That sounds odd to me. How can they willfully reject if they can't willfully reject? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, it's like how can God do the impossible? If it's impossible for the unregenerate to reject, then God can't cause them to do something they couldn't have done anyway. I mean, they're not rejecting because God does it. Besides... The verses we looked at, you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. You're not willing to come to me that you may have life. This sure doesn't sound like it's the Calvinist argument that God's doing this to them. I don't think the passages fit. I've encountered some Calvinists who argue that man in their fallen state is in a natural and constant state of rejection towards God and that um, the, they would explain these passages and I, I'm pretty confident I've had this debate with some yeah. some Calvinists at one point or another in my life that they said no, no, no that's man's natural state these other people everyone else they were the people who accepted these people in, in verse 48 those were the elect ones and it's contradicted to the unelect ones who, who are in their natural state of willful rejection yeah. I guess that's more of a comment than a question. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I guess that's what they would say. It's just to me that doesn't make sense. How can you reject something if you have no spiritual sensitivity to that something? I mean, it seems to me what they're saying is they can understand it and reject it. 
Yeah, Steve, I, I don't know. I don't get the argument, but I hear what you're saying, and it does sound like what I would hear from a... Generally speaking, rejection implies the opposite as well, that it could have been accepted. So you can't, you can't have an offer to somebody who has... You can't make an offer to a rock. It's not going to respond. And then, then yell at it because it's a rock. Yeah. Well, sad. that's a good point. John 1, 11 right. and John 1, 12 does seem to bring this out. Yeah. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them he gave, gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And so it's like belief is said in contrast to the rejection. Right. Well, if rejection is possible, doesn't that suggest right. that the belief is also possible? Isn't the flip yeah. side also possible? Yeah. I guess the Calvinists would say, no, it's just one side is possible. But to me, all of this, to me, all of it is forced. And it's like if, if we didn't have the system, we would never get it from just looking at the scriptures, I don't think. Yeah. As, as Tony, uh, Dr. Badger pointed out, it's really a system based upon logic. Uh, right. And if... And, we're not saying it's illogical that what the Bible says. It is not, it is not built upon a logic. It's built upon God's revelation. Yeah. We've got a, a one over here. And, and then Jeff has an Internet one. Is that right? Okay. Is what you're saying that this state of rejection is in essence an act of will? That's a yes, Steve. You're saying it's willful? I think he was saying it to you, both of you. Are you saying that the rejection is willful? Yes. Yeah. That's what, that's what, uh, uh, you think what it all, if you're willfully, 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 you can't have something that has no ability to have any willful anything. Okay, we got another internet person. Yeah, another one from the internet. Um, and they, I think they mentioned or were implying that there are paradoxes within Calvinism, but are there paradoxes within the free grace viewpoint? Well, I don't think Calvinists call them paradoxes. They, what do they call that? Uh, an antinomy? Two things which appear to be contradictory but aren't actually contradictory. Um, if the question is, are there difficult questions, um, the answer is yes. And they're difficult questions for any system, for Calvinism, Arminianism, for the grace position, for the, the biblical position. You know, Peter does say there are many things hard to understand in the writings of Paul, right? So if that's true, it's true. Uh, and I don't think uh, we can say somehow there aren't any difficult questions. But I remember I was debating Dr. Ken Sarles at Dallas Seminary back in, I think it was 91, and we had a two-day brown bag discussion in front of about 250 students. And we were discussing the whole issue of faith and assurance. He was coming from a five-point, well, four-and-a-half-point Calvinist position, whatever. And I was coming from the grace position. And in the course of the whole discussion, um, it basically came out that he was saying that we couldn't be sure of our eternal destiny um, and that he had 99.9 percent .9 assurance, um, but that it wasn't absolute certainty because his name wasn't written in the Bible. In fact, I pointed out, well, there are people in the Bible, like we know that Clement's name is in the Book of Life, Euodia and Syntyche's name in the Book of Life. The apostles knew they were going to sit on 12 thrones and rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. I said, what do you do with those people? He said, yeah, they were certain, absolutely certain. But we can't be because our name's not in the Bible. And that's what Robert Gentry also says. Robert Gentry says the same thing. He says, Robert Gentry's name is not in the Bible, so I can't know I'm one of the elect. What was the question again? I completely forgot it, but it was good. The question was, are there any paradoxes in the So in terms of uh, paradoxes, this guy at one point, Ken Sarles at one point says, look, are you an infallible interpreter of the Bible? We, were, we had some, you know, direct cross-examination. And I said no, and he laughed, and most of the audience laughed. And he says, well, then how can you be sure of your interpretation? 
And I said to him, you know, it's one thing, Dr. Sarles, to say I'm not certain in my interpretation of every verse in the Bible. It's another thing to say I don't know what John 3.16 means. And you're telling me we don't know anything in the Bible for sure. Nothing. That's what we call post-modernity. We're sure of nothing. And then you die. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lousy way to live. Obviously, there's much in Scripture that's called the milk of the word. And the milk of the word is obvious. It's duh. We get that. Now, the meat of the word, there's, that's where you're talking about paradoxes and difficult things. Sure. But in the milk of the word, most of what Calvinism talks about is milk of the word stuff. And Calvinism wants to somehow make it complicated. Yeah. The very first statement you made, it's found at the top of the handout. Calvinism believes in what is called replacement theology. I'm not sure I heard you give your support for that. Were you referring to their stance on covenant theology then? Yes. Okay. Yeah, covenant theology and the, and the idea that ultimately Israel has been replaced. Um, okay, we'll take one last one from the audience, and if there's any more on the Internet, that'll end it. If not, this will be the last one. Will you elaborate on what you said about faith not being a choice? Yeah, in my view, uh, the question is about faith not being a choice. In my view, the evidence either persuades us or doesn't persuade us. And if you notice in many of the things I mentioned tonight, Jesus talks about evidence, my works. Why don't believe because of my works? Or John the Baptist, why didn't you believe him? That was evidence. The Old Testament scriptures, that was evidence. And so the evidence is either persuasive or non-persuasive. And so in my opinion... You don't choose to believe, for example, in socialism or communism or capitalism. You don't choose to believe the grace message or the lordship message or this message or that message. Ultimately, you're persuaded by some evidence that you look at. But on the other hand, a person can choose to be blind to the evidence. And like what Trent's talking about, sounds like he's had a lot of conversations with people who aren't that open to what he has to say. And if they're not really that open, then the conversation isn't that fruitful because the, there really is no evidence because they're not even listening. Uh, yeah, Jeff. Okay, another question from the internet. Do Calvinists have assurance and where do they find it? Do Calvinists have assurance and where do they find it? We'll talk about this more in the, con in the conference as we go on. Um, and yeah, John, I'll get you at the end, and then we'll end with John's comment. Uh, but what they call assurance is not certainty. Calvinists have what they call assurance, and then they have what they call full assurance. And full assurance is not certainty, and assurance is not certainty. In Calvinism, what you're, when they talk about assurance or full assurance, they're talking about confidence, some sort of hope, some sort of, you know, I think it looks probable that I might make it, that kind of thing. I've talked, I've debated in quite a few Calvinists, I've talked to many Calvinists, and what I've found is they will honestly say, I don't know for sure if I'm going to persevere, because if Paul wasn't sure, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, then neither can we be. And he says, and if I don't persevere, then I'll prove I wasn't elect, and I'm going to go to the lake of fire. And I've had Calvinist pastors and theologians tell me that. Now, I had a debate with James White, and he, you know, we went back and forth, but ultimately toward the, he w refused to say he had assurance, and then finally toward the end he said he had assurance, but then he had to kind of not say he was absolutely certain. Yeah, uh, John. We have a term to describe deciding to believe. We have a term for deciding to believe. It's make-believe. <laughs> Okay, there you go. All right, well, thank you, everybody, and... Uh...